Paul Taylor is one of the world's most recognized and acclaimed choreographers. We caught him at home in New York between performances. Choreographer Paul Taylor says he is proud to be a plurality. A group of crisscrossing travelers unto myself, as he puts it in his 1987 autobiography. There's the sunny, funny Paul Taylor. What I think is funny is often not what other people think is funny. And it's very hard to judge how an audience is going to react. But it's an area that has interested me for a long time because um, of the variety of kinds of approaches to humor that there are. The slapstick and then there's something a little more um, satirical or um, even black. And all of these things, I think, are, are uh, fair game. There's Paul Taylor, the loner. Frankly, I don't go out very much. I'm mostly in my studio working with my dancers. I've never felt particularly talented. I don't wait around for a muse to strike. That seems a very foreign idea to me. But I have been able to focus, which means arranging my life so that not a lot of distractions from my main intent. You know, your privacy becomes a little more important to you. There's the music lover who revels in pure motion. That's one of the things that I enjoy most about making dances, is that combination of the movement with the sound. I've never thought that being musical was Mickey mouse music, like following it tightly, but making a counterpoint to it. There was Paul Taylor, the performer, for nearly 20 years the centerpiece of his own choreography. I think towards the end of my dancing days, dancing had become so painful and it was not ever really fun for me. Frankly, I never really liked to be watched. And <laughs> it was always sort of a, a, a funny situation to find myself in. There's the father figure, head of his own company for nearly 40 years. I didn't really decide to have a company. It was just a matter of being very critical of other people's dances and then deciding, well, I'll, I'll just make some of my own. And then you find yourself on the road with this little group of people, and it's a company. I mean, they're wonderful. I, I'm very fond of all of them, but they are people, and they're a group of people, and you're responsible for them. And there are the awards and honorary degrees. Paul Taylor, the certified genius MacArthur Fellow, Kennedy Center honoree, routinely referred to as the world's greatest living choreographer. <laughs> How do you feel when you hear that? <laughs> I feel like people probably think I wrote it myself. <laughs> 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 oh, I like it. I like it. I, like it. I think it's great. Uh, how about, I mean, I think it could be better. How about if it were the world's all-time greatest choreographer? <laughs> Paul Belleville Taylor Jr. was born in 1930 into a depression-ravaged family that shuttled him around to various homes, schools, friends, and relations. He danced for the first time in public at Syracuse University and soon headed to New York City, where modern dance was in its salad days. He danced with Martha Graham, Merce Cunningham, George Balanchine, and in 1957, he debuted in his own choreography at the 92nd Street Y. At the tone, the time will be 
It was seven dances, and each one had to do with found objects. It was what you see around you every day. It was walking and running in different <laughs> postures, you know, sitting and folding arms, and, and it was just ordinary. It wasn't what you call dance movement. I got very interested in stillness, and it made one whole duet where we never moved at all. The curtain went up, we were there, and then three minutes later the curtain came down, and that was it. And uh, I couldn't understand why I was leaving. <laughs> Taylor's subsequent experiments were more successful and crowd-pleasing. He collaborated with visual artists such as Robert Rauschenberg and Alex Katz. He and his dancers toured the country and eventually the world. And when an injury ended Taylor's own performing career in 1974, he kept right on making dances, more than a hundred of them to date. The company is weathering the storm of funding cuts and the general slump that followed the dance boom of the 70s and 80s. It's a cycle, Taylor says, and it's a fact of American cultural life. Our tradition has been a puritanical one and uh, the dance and, and music even uh, have been long considered, you know, questionable, to say the least. Is that maybe why, why we uh, have such a problem with public funding for the arts in this country? Yes, that, and that it's taxpayers' money, you see, and, it, and since we're a so-called democracy, we are democracy, that money therefore has to be given out fairly and democratically. And the trouble is that art is, has never been democratic. It has to do with excellence. It has to do with, pardon the E word, but, but it has, has to do with the finer things in life. And um, it is not um, a, a, something you can level out and, and dole out Fairly. It's not about that. There's nothing fair in the theater. But I'm not a doom and gloomer about this subject at all. As long as they're young people, which there seem to be, there's, there's going to be vitality and new blood in this field. I think dance is something that is almost genetic in all of us. I think we're just made that way, and I think it's a very important part of our lives. And I don't mean just theater dancing, but social dancing, all types of movement. I think if you talk to a lot of people that you wouldn't expect would be interested at all in dance, they'll let you in on the fact that they might have wanted to be a dancer themselves at some time, or at least that dance symbolizes something to them like life.